رمضان ده حياتي حل اوقاتي يا رب صلاتي تقبل هاتول ما احلى حجابي جمل اوقاتي وزي صحباتي عايزين عطول رمضان ده حياتي سماع ذنباتي يا رب دعاتي إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من جهد هنا فلا مد له ومن يدل فلا حادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وعده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. This will be the presentation outline. Briefly, I will introduce the topic. We look at what happened globally within the Islamic Ummah. We look at the COVID-19 situation in Ghana. We look at the government's support policy. We also look at the experience by Muslim Ummah. We all knew that in 2019, we've experienced another pandemic. That pandemic, because it occurred in 19, uh, 2019, it was named COVID-19. COVID and we all know that measures were put in place to control the transmission mechanism of the virus. This include movement control order, the lockdowns, the closure of restaurants, the closure of places of worship, including mosques and churches. Let us also remember that this is not the first time we've been experiencing this kind of pandemics. If you remember in 1919, 1920, now during the First World War, we experienced the Spanish flu. In 1957 to 1958, when we were having our independence, we also experienced what, we, what it was known as Asian flu. In 1968 to 1969, we also had an experience of what we call Hong Kong flu. And in 2019, in, in 2019, we had what was known as H1N1. And in 2014, in West Africa, we have what we call Ebola. So let's get in mind that Surely, there will be also be another pandemic. But what is the experience now? And then how do we develop a model? Or how do we develop a system? So that when the new one comes, we will be able to sail through. Probably maybe it will be when we are alive or our next generation. Now, let's look at... Is it, Whenever there is a uh, what do you call pandemics, everybody is supposed to say something. So our Muslim world was also able to say something. In Egypt, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Morocco, they all said something. Some of them were saying that this is the divine punishment against non-believers. No, I don't think so. It is not a punishment for only non-believers. It's punishment for all, including the believers, because we are aware that some sheikhs, some clerics, they've all experienced this COVID, and then some of them have passed away. So it's not a punishment against anybody. Then others were also saying that others were trying to provide an advice given that we need to 
uh, or we must listen to our authorities. You see, when there was a pandemic around March last year, and there was a lockdown, those who didn't obey the rules were majority Muslims in the Zongo area, which I come to the reason why they were unable to obey the rules. Okay, in Turkey, in Kuwait, they all have to say something because they think that even in Kuwait, instead of making the normal hazan, they change the hazan to COVID so that everybody must pray in his or in her own what house. It's not by force, even though praying Jama prayers is the compulsory, but we are not in the normal situation. No, in the normal situation, you need to do that. But in abnormal situation, you need to obey the rules. Okay, so in Morocco, is it we we the, the Muslim Ummah has a problem. Not until we ask God intervention for us to obey the authorities. So in, 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 in Morocco, when the president or when the king issued an instruction that all of us have to be indoor, you have to pray in your own house, don't come out to pray Jama. But we saw some people saying that no, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, didn't authorize the closure of mosques. If, even though I'm not an historian in, in Islamic, when a pandemic didn't happen in our Prophet's time, that does not mean that if a pandemic happened, and those with the knowledge tells you that stay an indoor, and you come and tell us that, no, our Prophet Muhammad didn't tell us to, to not to pray in the mosque. You could have also told the person that, obviously, Prophet Muhammad didn't also explain, didn't take a plane to travel. So you should also not take a plane to travel. Good. So now let's look at, having discussed, having made the introduction, having discussed what happened globally among our Islamic folks, what happened in Ghana? We were told that the COVID-19 occurred in Ghana on March 12, 2020. And this happened with a two guys from Norway and then take it. So it means that this was an imported COVID. This was an imported COVID. So a week later, the, the president have to organize the Muslim Ummah to pray. So you've seen where the politicians are. When the recesses, they will not invite you. But when there is a problem, they will invite you to come and then pray. And of course, our chief imam obey the instruction from the president to pray for the nation. And then the, and the week later, that was 20, March 21, 2020, we recorded 21 cases. So from 12, when we recorded two, two weeks later, we recorded 21, and all these cases were imported. So the president has to take a decision to close all the borders, including the sea, the air, and the land, so that we will be able to manage the, the pandemics. So given that on March 21, We've had 21 cases. The government has to step in to what is now termed as what? Lockdown. So they lock down greater crowd. They lock down 
Kaswa, and they also lock down what it is now termed as Greater Kumasi Metropolis. We didn't have Greater Kumasi Metropolis, but for the pandemic, we had Greater Kumasi pandemic. But so in, by September 1, 2020, we don't know the government has to come in again to open the, 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 travel, the ban on travel for only air. And we don't know what emanated from that. Probably maybe in the thinking of the president, he thought that all these 21 cases were actually imported. And they, they weren't imported from the sea, now that they were imported from the land. They were all imported by the air. So the, the, the airport has to, be closed, uh, has to be locked down or has to, has to be closed. But by the 1st September 2020, we have to reopen only the air, what they call transport. So God being so good to us, even though some of us have not taken the first job, on 24 February 2021, government received the first, what they call, dossier for, uh, from COBAS. We actually didn't pay for this. So it's a free donation to the government and the people of Ghana. So let me see by hand those of us who have taken the first job. Even though there are some skepticism about the taking of the, of the job, but if medically it has been proven that it's good, then I'm sure that we will take it. But the fear too is that we've taken the first job, but when do we know the second job will be taken when? And do we also know that by the second job, we'll get enough vaccine to vaccine at least those who took the first job? Let's pray for the better. So let's look at the summary of what the government of Ghana has done so far. There's the closure of mosques, churches, schools, social gathering. They decided to spray the market, but I don't know the essence of spraying the market. Why? Are we going to kill the, the, the mouse or we are going to kill is, 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 the, is, the, is the virus rotates within the, our market space? Well, we don't know, but they are saying that we need to sanitize our market. Our market needs total overhaul, not only the, the, the spray. No, our market needs actually total overhaul. There was a mandatory quarantine. They restricted those who want to travel. They closed some of the borders. We performed national prayers. And there was also lockdown. And God being so good, on 24th February, we had our first vaccination. Good. So, this was the situation from the 12th of March to date. So, what were the policy when we had our first COVID? So, we grouped this policy response, health, economic, and the social. For the health, what government did was to provide insurance package and then the tax relief for the so-called frontline health workers. So those who want to understand what is known as tax relief, and that the government is give, just as you have a pain, if you have a pain, you take a painkiller. The pain, what does the painkiller do? The painkiller doesn't remove your illness, but the painkiller tries to subdue your pains, but it will come back. So what the government did was, 
they give you the insurance in the event that you die, the, 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 the insurance package will take care of your dependents. The, the government gives the tax relief. Tax relief means that they've, they've subsidized or they remove some of your, your income. That income will not attract tax. But let me also take this opportunity, especially those of us who work in the in the in the in the who works and then pay tax. We have several tax reliefs. We have uh, what they call responsibility relief. When if you are married or you take care of at least two children, if you are disabled, twenty-five percent of your total accessible income from either employment or a business if you have somebody who depend on you for a livelihood you have a relief and if you have a children at least three of them so our sheikh who has 17 children the only three of them will qualify for this relief so the government has given tax relief for frontline workers and then also what government also did was to establish a research center for what they term as what disease control and within the health government says that is doing three things or th three t's tracing testing and then what treatment but i don't know whether we'll be able to treat majority of us so the sixth point is the vaccination so that is this is for the health. This is for the health. So now let's look at the economy. The government's main objective is to protect jobs. Is to protect jobs. And then for that matter, protecting livelihood. And government also established what they call coronavirus alleviation program for business support. The government provided 174 million US dollars for those activities. And the government also set up what they term as COVID-19 National Trust Fund. So within the economic space, these are the things that the government did to survive, the, to ensure that the businesses survive, and then for that matter, we we'll have to also get money to support the economy. Let's look at the social. I mean, it's saying that, okay, there are a lot of us who will be supported by way of free water. So now we've realized that actually that water is not free. I say, even though the government is saying that I'm giving you free water, there's nothing like free, uh, what they call lunch in anywhere. There's a free water, of course, even though at that time we needed it. So it's a very good policy for the government to give all of us free water. Also subsidize electricity payment and government also distributed food and in some cases, hot meal to students and vulnerable groups. So this is what government did for the social. Okay, so now let's come to what's the subject matter. The experience of Ghanaian Muslim Ummah. The first negative experience was the ban on congregational prayers at the mosque. The underlying word here is that you cannot pray in Jama at what? At mosque. But that will not prevent you if you are like my sheikh. You cannot pray a congregational prayers in your house. So the Friday prayers was also banned. Our madrasas, I attended Tafsilia. 
So I actually also asked question in the next slide that what happened to our madrasas? But we shall come, we shall come to that. But we also remember that COVID happened last year during the Ramadan. So we will not be able, we were also weren't able to make a group if that uh, what you call press. And also because the the, the general community activities has been what has been also been closed down. In social, that's where we actually felt the impact. Because the congressional prayers is not everybody who normally attend congressional prayers. Not everybody. But so even if you tell me that, don't go in and pray at the mosque, hallelujah. Because all of, obviously, previously, I've not been praying what they call congressional prayers. So the effect, the impact, the experience will be minimal. The experience or the impact will be minimal in terms of the congressional prayers. But the social, that is the consequences. Our madrasas are all off. And during that period, schools were asked to organize their lessons through, uh, through Zoom or virtual. How many of our madrasas have access to internet? How many of us? Even the, the malams, the teachers, they don't even have access to internet. And then here you are asking me that all my teaching, all my activities at the Makaranta or at the Madrasa must be made virtual. That was a single problem that we had. We don't have the schools like the Christ the King. We don't have. Or who can tell me that the Muslim Ummah has one school which can be compared to the Christ the King. Christ the King is just here. We don't have. And that is our challenge. And that to me was the most negative impact, the closure of the madrasa. So I was asking, now they've even asked us to reopen our schools and to conduct all the social protocols, all the COVID-19 protocols. If you know that you cannot afford or you cannot meet the protocols, then you should not open. So I've put a question here. How are our madras been able to operate? And how will we able to resolve this? Going forward, we'll provide some solutions. We've already discussed the communal spirit among Muslim Ummah. So during the COVID, you cannot hug your, 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 your fellow brother. You cannot hug him. You only have to do this kind of what? Handshake. And, 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 and in Islam, the woman you say, Salaamu Alaikum, or Assalamu Alaikum, the next move is to hug the person. But because for the COVID, we were unable to do, to, do, to do that. And this was also a blow to everybody, including Ghanaian Muslims. Last year, none 
there wasn't a single soul that attended Hajj. So, uh, as I will put it here, for the first time since creation of Ghana, meaning that for the first time, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't know the, the, the history before the independent. But after the independent, I knew very well that every year, Muslim folks in Ghana here attend Hajj. But last year, no a single soul attended the Hajj. Because how do you go? When the owner of the mosque, even though the mosque belongs to belong to belong to the Allah, but he's telling you that I've closed my border. You cannot employ, you cannot walk, and you cannot travel into my country. I've already suspended visa. So without a visa, you cannot also attend Hajj. So this is actually to me a very big blow to Muslim Ummah in, in Ghana. So let's look at the effects on economy. The first was the response from the government. But what is the impact on economics? The economic shock brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in the reduction of income of unskilled labor. And we know, we all know, all of us here, and those who are listening to us via the internet, know that when it comes to unskilled labor, Ghanaian Muslims are in the majority. Here is the case that you are even a skilled, you are even, even, even if you have a skill, you've lost your job. Those who are working in the hotels were all lost their job. But here is the case that you are an unskilled person. Where will you get an income? How will you support your family? So this is also a lesson to us. And how do you become a skillful person? You have to attend to school. And you have to attend good school, good madrasa. That's the key. All of us here, me included, I'm making this presentation because I've attended a good school. I'm making this presentation, or you invited me to make this presentation because I attended St. Augustine's College. Do we have a secondary school equivalent to St. Augustine's? We don't. The TI and media that we have, well, let me just reserve my comment for now. Let's look at the, the second the second the second okay next so I turn the economic impact into two one to the individuals the other one is to the community we all know that our must operate using the fixed bidding line. We operate our mosque using the Friday contributions. So here is the case that the Friday prayers have been banned. You cannot go and then perform your prayers, let alone give some few coins after the prayers. So in that case, you see that some, there is a story that a lot of our mosques 
their utility has been what? Has been cut. Because they don't have the money to pay for the utility bills. They don't have the money because people were not allowed to visit the mosque. People were not allowed to visit the mosque. Because that is the only source of uh, income for the mosque. The uh, mosques do not know the term diversification. They've never heard of it. That you need to diversify your sources of what? Income. You need to diversify your sources of your income. Two, the second point is our madrasas. Yes, I told you, late 80s, I attended Tafsilia. I don't know those who stayed at Nima. No Tafsilia. That's the Mala Hamza's madrasa. Our Malams, or so to speak, our teachers, depends on what we call kudun water. Kudun water means that your monthly what? Fees. So, that is the source of income for our, our teachers. But here is the case that the madrasa has been shut down. The mosque has not been diversified. If the mosque has not been diversified, will the teacher diversify his income? The only sources of income is the cooling water. The only sources of income is what is the cooling water. So it's also a lesson to us as Muslim teachers who teach in this madrasa to diversify your sources of what? Income. Because surely there will be a future pandemic. The mental health is to everybody, but we our own is more. If, if the mental health challenges is to everybody, Muslims, or for that matter, those of us who stay in Zongo, and the Zongo qualify to be what? An informal settlement. All our Zongos. I'll show you some research that we are, we, we are doing. All our Zongos qualify to be what? To be a slam. So, if somebody who stays in this area, this cantonment, had a mental challenge because of the COVID-19, who the person stays in an air-conditioned room, drives in an air-conditioned car, works in an air-conditioned office, suffered mentally. So what will be the suffering for a person who stay in slum where there is no briefing space? Very, also very important aspect of our barrier of Islamic, uh, what do you call Muslim folks. The government says that if you die out of COVID, you will be having a special barrier services. Your family will not know you or your family will not get to know where you are buried. And at least I should know where my mother, my sister, my brother has been buried so that in future I may go there to offer some prayers. But look at it. We will not be able to experience this because you will not even know where the body will be. It will be what? Mass 
better. So I, was, I put up a question. How will you feel if you are unable to bury or know the burial place of your loved one? How will you feel? It's very painful indeed. Okay, we had some donations from Chinese community, from MTN, and also from private sector. You can see that our brother was championing the private sector initiative. We should also know that just as they are saying that the hand that gives normally has more blessing the hands than the hand that was received. So the Muslim community led by our national chief imam also donated to the COVID-19 trust fund. Okay, so we are getting to the, to the last stage of my presentation. But just as I was telling you, I had a grant to conduct a research titled Adopting Pandemics Management to Vulnerable Population. And they look at an accountant or look at a prof, uh, what they call accounting professor or accounting uh, or finance professor trying to conduct a research on vulnerable population. So actually we did that, we, we wrote a proposal, very solid proposal uh, to other research firm. Uh, to my information, we were around more than 1,000 applicants, but they only selected 10. And God being so good, I was among of the, thousand, uh, of the 10 fellows who had to receive some money to conduct this research. Good. So our, our aim is to actually look at the impact of the COVID-19 on vulnerable population. That's as my topic suggests, adopting pandemic management. I'm in the management school, I'm in the business school. So I'm going to look at how do we manage a vulnerable population after or during or after the pandemic. And our objective is to first assess the impact. And then the second objective is to develop a measure so that we'll be able to use it in the future what occurs. Because we believe that obviously the, the vulnerable will actually suffer compared to those in the affluent places. Okay, and we collected, is it the, the country has been divided into 101 slums. The country as a whole by some, uh, what do you call it, there's some NGO, is it people and the places or so, they've actually conducted the research and then group the slums, or what they call in the literature as an informal settlement. In the literature, you don't see slum, but you see what they call as what? Informal settlement, because your settlement is what? It's not formal. Any settlement that is formal has a road, has water, has very good air. But in Nima, we don't have a road. Where I, where I used to stay, I need to walk from the, from, the, from the gutter to my house. So if I'm sick, I have, they have to carry me to the road. They zone this informal settlement, 101 of it. And this is across 12 administrative regions, Greater Accra, Central, Volta, Ashanti, Western, Northern, Savannah, Northeast, Eastern, Bono East, Bono, and then Ahaf. 
and per our initial analysis, more than 50% of these slums of this informal settlement are in the Zongos. More than 50% of it. They are in the majority. So if you look at it, I've highlighted them in the red ink, or I've colored them in the red ink. You look at Nima, we all know Nima. You look at Alajo, we all know Alajo. Nima 441, those of us who stayed in Nima know Nima 441. It's, it's very big. I was just wondering when we we're doing the, the, the when we we're sending the enumerators to those places. We we're wondering because Nima proper and then 441, there is no boundary. And I doubt how, how did they know that from the Nima, the Nima is different from what? Nima 441. So it means that they actually did a very good what? research to come out with this with this slums. We have Malata, we have Nima Alafia, Kaokudi. I, I know that a lot of us know Kaokudi. If you don't know the I know the proper. Kaokudi means that bring your money. That, that's where the, the armed robbers normally used to stay. It's a junction. It's a junction towards uh, what do you call good house. I don't know whether if you know a good house. At that time, that area or yeah, all of them are. We, you don't have a road. You have a footpath. So if you are going to airport and from Nima or from Mambubi, you have to necessarily pass there. So they will be there. There's a junction there. They call it Kaokudi Junction. So if you get there, you collect all your valuable items. So we have Kaokudi, we have Nima Suraj. I don't know whether if you know Nima Suraj. So in zone two. So because Accra has the total majority of the slums, so we group them into six zones. We group Accra slums into six zones. So zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, up to what? Zone, zone six. Then we we'll group Kumase here. Yeah. Kumase, okay, so this is Kaswa. So Kaswa, we have Kaswa Zongo, and we have Insakina. I don't know. Insakina, I don't know, I don't know there, but that, 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 that is a Zongo, that, that is also a Zongo community. And in, in, in Kumasi, we also zone them into two. We have zone one and then zone two. So you have Dagomba line, Asukwa Zongo, Moshi Zongo, uh, Sawaba, Aswasi, Asibi, and then Jalwa. And you look at the other side, it, they are suburb. But even though they are well populated, they are also what they call slums. But even though they, they will be Muslims, the bad majority of them are not what? Muslim. So if you go to the western region, we have two. Northern, all of them, they are all slums. Bronga Hafu too, we have some. And then also Vota, we have some. So when we calculated, we had more than 50, more than 50 percent of them being, being Zongo community. So you just imagine, out of 100 and 101, if you have more than 50%, meaning that 60 towns are all dwelled by Muslims, without a proper drainage, proper road, proper air, and then we are also noted for doing the, bra, uh, the bad what, things. We are also noted for doing the bad things. Okay, so let me make my recom uh, recommendation before I conclude. This COVID-19 has taught all of us a lesson. So we are calling upon Muslim community leaders 
the imams, the malams, the sheikhs, to start thinking about sustainable economic welfare. The underlying word there is what? Sustainable economic welfare of our Muslim ummah. And then we believe that we'll be able to do that if we, we hear me that all of us, put this as a priority to establish wealth managed World what Manage Muslim Development Fund, Ghana. World Manage Muslim Development Fund. Our Islamic NGO need to double up. We didn't hear of them during the COVID. Probably maybe others might have heard from them, but me, I didn't hear of them. So, I was saying that they need to double up. If they are doing it, then they need to do it more. Their effort has we were not heard or seen them during the pandemic. So on my last note, I will suggest that they, this pandemic is an eye-opener it's an eye-opener for all, and we need to take it as serious as it is. And in particular, Muslims should regard this current pandemic as a text from God Almighty and a call to return to him, believe in him, wisdom, uh, for a such a trial and a remain hopeful for recovery. Akuli kauli aza wa astaghfirullahul azim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. There are a lot of uh, lessons to learn from this lecture. I don't have much useful thing to add to many things that he has said. But I have three issues I want to that crop up during the pandemic among Muslims that I want to us to reflect on. And the first was the, the Safu Dilemma, what I call the Safu Dilemma, where Muslims, even when they ask us that we can go to the mosque, they say we cannot stand shoulder to shoulder. We need to give social distance. In some mosques, they fought. In fact, that social distance that came up about as a result of COVID challenged our scholars to do more ishtihad. Because some, some Muslim scholars were confused. Some were standing in mocks and saying that there's no way. The Prophet says when we are, we, are, we, are, we are praying, we should stand shoulder to shoulder. Eh? And so you can hear the, the Imam anytime you stand in, a, in the in the Safu, eh, in the Sufu, you say Etedulu, eh, Watarasu. He's asking you to be shoulder to shoulder. And now COVID has come, we need to observe social distance. Some of our scholars didn't have any idea. So they even told their con congregants not to separate, not to observe that social distance. But they challenged some scholars to come out and say, no. Social distance does not destroy the prayer, the salah that we do. If you don't stand shoulder to shoulder, it doesn't actually destroy your salah or it doesn't you know, validate your salah. It was a problem for, for Muslims. And for me, where it had making effort to bring certain, you know, uh, uh, um, 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 direction to the Muslim Ummah. Where it matters most is when we have challenges. That's where your scholarship must show. When we need you to direct us and we cannot find it directly in the Quran or the Sunnah. 
then that is where scholarship comes in. If you come and be quoting Quran and Hadith for me, which is there, that is not scholarship. It is when you contextualize, con, con, you put it in context, the Quranic verse or that Hadith. Many of our scholars, you know, couldn't do that. Then we have, we had another problem, which is still, you know, destroying the Muslim community. I call it the chronic Muslim followership disobedience. Every Muslim is a scholar. Every Muslim thinks that he knows. Every Muslim thinks that you are an island on your, on your own. So sometimes our leaders give us instruction and we don't follow. So he talks about, you know, the chief imam and other leaders saying we shouldn't go to mosque, for instance. Some went to mosque. Some went to mosque. Some were arrested. In fact, we, we needed the state force to be in line. We were not listening to our leaders. And so sometimes we talk about, you know, we have problem, a leadership problem. But we, our major problem is followership problem. Muslims don't want to follow their leaders. And that's why, you know, we, are, we find all this problem that we are, we, are, we, are, we are facing across the world. Muslim, every Muslim wants to be alone. You know, so we have so much divided. We don't want to follow, you know, um, leadership. Then there's this thing that happened. You remember Eid, at the peak of um, um, the pandemic, when we were going to do Eid the Fitr, we were told that we cannot go to Eid as normal. And we were told you know, to do Eid in our homes. And the question was whether that family leader, eh, whether he knows Islam and he can lead Eid, Yeah. And so, some actually didn't do it. They did not fill up. Because he doesn't know. And even some of family leaders, especially we the men, we don't pray with our families. We don't, you know, care, you know, about the way the families should come together for, for, for the sake of, to discuss issues of Islam. Forget about the eat. Even the normal prayer. Some family leaders couldn't lead their families in prayer at home. There was a problem. I had many calls. And so, how do you do this? How do you do that? Scholars are professionals. He's a professional. But he doesn't know his religion. And now, it was time for him to lead his own. So, you go to the mosque, all right, you know, to follow imams. But now, it's time for you to lead the prayer at home. And sometimes the younger ones, you know, the small ones who go to Makanta, they, they know. So now you stand before them, you know, and you pray, and they know that my, my dad is not praying well. How do you feel? It was a problem within, you know, um, another time. And so these are the major three major things I want to add. That first, we will need to, Muslim scholars need to do more ikhtihad and put things that we do in context. There are things that you can put in context in Ghana, and the Quran allows that. That cannot be done in Saudi. There are things that is done in Saudi, you cannot implement it in Ghana, because the, the, society, the Saudi society is different from the Ghanaian society. We need to do that. We need to, whatever, what, we may have, no, not good leaders, we may have, we may. But once they are called leaders, we must, be, we must follow them and also help them to direct you know, our affairs. But for you to say, oh, I don't believe that you are my leader, so you know, whatever you know, you know, the leader says, we don't follow, that is rather going to destroy us the more. And for me, COVID you know, has taught us to learn our religion. Whatever we are, we must learn our religion and make sure that we apply the religion. I think these are the three major things I want to add. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Prof. Amidu for the wonderful delivery. I wish we could have him every six months to do a delivery on a subject close to what he has done for us. But there are some few comments. Somebody asked, what's the difference between Zakat Fund and Development Fund? As for Zakat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned eight people who are supposed to benefit. So you can use zakat money to build a mosque. You can use zakat money to build, uh, how do you call it, roads. 
You can use zakat money to do so many things, apart from the eight that Allah SWT has to categorize. But a development fund is wider in terms of its operational scope than zakat. The second thing is that Dr. Zagun said that what our, because of differences in circumstances and conditions, what may prevail, may be relevant in Saudi Arabia, may not be relevant here. Uh, on a point of uh, interest, if it is a Quranic verse, he is not saying that what the Quran has said should operate in Saudi Arabia and should not operate here. That is not what he is saying. And if there is a hadith, authentic hadith, if it operates in Saudi Arabia, it has to operate here. But one scholar, Imam Ibn Qayyim al jawziya looked at fatwa in respect of a situation that crops up, but there is no Quranic verse on it. There is no hadith that is giving direction. So we are going to rely on the independent judgment of the scholar. In such a situation, Ibn Qayyim al jawziya says that al-fatwa yatagayyaru bitagayyur zaman wal makan. He says that fatwa changes from one situation to another. That is why in the history of Imam Shafi, he had two schools of legal thought, one in Iraq and one in Egypt. There was some fatwa he gave in Iraq. When he came to Egypt, he changed all of them. And then Imam Vikrullah mentioned Iman and Ilm. That brings us to the issue of the attachment of a Muslim to Islam. The Muslim is supposed to have two attachments to this religion. Emotional attachment and intellectual attachment. The spiritual attachment is part of the emotional one. More often than not, it is the emotional one that drives us. The intellectual attachment is knowing the religion, propagating it, and defending it when it is necessary. In 2000, when was that? The incident in France, I think 2016 or 15, where the Kulibali brothers went and killed 17 people because they had insulted the prophet. The Herald magazine had insulted the prophet. But even the prophet himself, when he was alive, he was insulted, but never used force. Huh? Revelations came to defend him. So it means that you have to defend the prophet with knowledge. And you can't worship Islam or worship Allah with ignorance. It doesn't, it's unacceptable in this religion. And Prof was saying that in respect of the schools, when the hijab issue came up, the then Christian Council General Secretary said, go and build your own schools. Go and build your own schools. Fortunately, the senior high schools, they are not of the best quality, but now a few of them are challenging the existing qualitative Christian schools. As I speak, the school with the highest population across the country and is doing well is Islamic Senior High School in Kumase. Their, their population is 6,000 students and they are performing very, very well. But the truth of the matter is that if we have our schools, we have to patronize them. Prof has taken us through a lot of issues and I don't think I can tackle all of them. Referring to his background, he mentioned that he is able to speak the way he speaks, bringing on board some Islamic elements because of his background, the mix of his background, the Makrantat mix plus the secular mix. Those who are very strong in Islam today, when you go to Nigeria, I don't know how many of you have listened to uh, Sanusi. When you listen to Sanusi, the former uh, Amir of, 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 of Kano, well, like, you see, real scholar of what a Muslim should be. He has Arabic, strong background in Arabic and Sharia, and strong background in banking. So he's speaking from both sides. So once the endeavor is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it very easy for us. Then we also have this sad comment from our professor. He says that we need sustainable economic welfare. He says that we need Muslim Development Fund. And Muslim NGOs, he was right. When Christians were donating, we were dead. Nobody was hearing of us. Of some people, they thought that is a punishment. 
for, for only kuffar. But listening to the verse of Allah in Surah Al Isra, Allah says, Wataku fitnatan la to see banan ladina dolemu minkum khasa. That fear, the affliction, or if you so wish, punishment, that will not affect only huh, the irreligious ones. Even the pious ones will also be affected. And that's what is happening. Everybody is suffering. So it's not an issue of punishment for, for, China. for, for China, punishment for America or non-Muslims. The Muslim countries are also suffering. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and other countries, they are also suffering. The second issue, some people will tell you the prophet doesn't have a fatwa huh, on such a thing. If you know the element of analogy, chaos, in Islamic law, you will know that the prophet has fatwa on this pandemic. Because the prophet Sallallahu made a statement that if there is a pandemic in an area, nobody should go there. What is it? That's social distancing. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's social. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's social distancing. So we should bring, we should contextualize some of these uh, uh, hadith that we know. But you see, unfortunately, some of our modern scholars do not have the capability to swim in the text, either Quran or hadith, and come out with relevant points for our lives. May Allah be with all of you.